Um, I've also just learned that every single person has a story to tell. It's just a matter of asking. Um, I did this project to honor the women that I interviewed, and I found out a lot about myself through my writing also. Um, I also, also truly believe that empowered women empower women, and so that was another goal of mine during, during my project. Lastly, I want to dedicate this project to my mom for fueling the flame behind my idea. This is for you. For my sub-essential question one, what is photojournalism? So journal journalism is based on a medium of words, while photojournalism is also based on a medium of words with a photo um, combined with it. So it's about cultivating a story and culti cultivating a story through a photo. So it's basically two parts that are supposed to complement each other. Um, these photos are supposed to be striking and believable. Um, also, photojournalists must promise that what they are creating is truthful. Many journalists are interviewers, which I did become through my project. Um, and also, photojournalism is supposed to make the viewers feel as though they are a part of a scene they, you, they wouldn't usually be exposed to. Um, so when you, many of you look at the photos from Haiti, that might open your eyes to something that you're not usually used to seeing. Um, the photos and the stories are meant to provoke raw emotion, unlike commercialized journalism, which has more of a direction in what is expected of you. It's way more creative, which is why I love it so much. My next sub-essential question is, are there different types of photojournalism? There are, in fact, many different types. Um, to list a few, the first one is feature photojournalism. And this involves human interest activities, whether that being art exhibits, um, new movies, sports, um, science, technology, and it's kind of like a PSA to get the word out about new things that are coming. Um, the next thing is sports photojournalism. So this captures the losses and the wins of sports games. If you guys go to your office, maybe on a Monday morning after the Patriots won a Super Bowl or something like that, um, the, you can usually see a bunch of articles that um, cultivate interviews from the players. So that's a really good example of sports journalism. And then lastly, environmental photojournalism, which is what I did in my project. This is the idea that essentially you're capturing the essence of a subject with its environment to back it up and um, bring so much more out of the photo. And so photojournalists should have a good imagination and human feeling and connection to what they are photographing. Um, it's supposed to be unique and inspiring photography. Um, and the background is also supposed to tell a story so that it just all loops in. My example of this is Evelyn. And when you first look at the photo, you see this beautiful woman, but also your eyes might look up at the tree above her head or the uh, mud made house behind her. And after reading the um, write up that I wrote about her, you would know that this house behind her, she was not only born and raised in, um, her mom raised her in this house. Her mom passed away in this house. She gave birth to her kids in this house and raised her kids in this house also. So this house is just so representative of who she is and that's why I placed her right in front of it. Um, and so that's just an example of the photo being beautiful on its own but the write-up really complementing the story. I need the photo. My sub essential question three, what makes a good portrait? So portraits are about one thing, and that is the person that's in them. So you're supposed to draw attention to the subject with lighting and background and depth of field. Um, the portrait should tell you something, despite the write-up, which I just mentioned, but also some technical um, parts to a portrait also. It should be eye level or up. Anything lower, you're getting nostrils, double chins, things you don't really want photographed. Um, a headshot focuses more on facial features, while a waist-up photo focuses more on background and body, um, body shape. And so another technical thing is that if you have to cut off limbs, cut off major joints, or else um, it's just not as pleasing to the eye. Um, another huge thing is that when the <coughs> subject feels comfortable, the photo looks more natural. So you want to put your subject in the most comfortable environment. So because you don't want an awkward photo or something that isn't representative of who they are because a camera is in front of them. Um, another huge thing is to focus on lighting, focus on depth of field, um, because when you go to edit the pictures, you don't want to ma be manipulating the photo too much. You want the rawest form of the image so that when you go to edit, 
You're just tweaking contrast, lighting, stuff like that. Next is my sub-essential question four, how do you interview someone? So what's huge about an interview is face-to-face. -face. Um, through my research, I saw that the two most common interviews are either face-to-face -face or over the phone. Um, over the phone is a lot less personal, um, and there's something about eye contact that really draws a connection with you and the person that you were interviewing. Um, so be prepared, and that's huge because I'm a planner and I really like to have things all laid out, but also prepare your subject so that when you get to the interview, you aren't blindsiding them by what you're asking. Um, I'll go into this more when I talk about my applied piece, but there was a list of questions that I was able to send all of the women that I interviewed so that they could pick and then uh, they would know what I would be asking. Um, have enough time, so some of the interviews lasted way longer than expected, but um, the time in between, I definitely had enough time so it didn't feel rushed or anything. They could definitely say everything they, they wanted to. Um, record it. So sometimes in the moment you're getting a lot of in, a lot of information from them and you want to write it all down, but it definitely loses that connection and the personal um, the the personal flow of what is going on in the interview. So definitely listen in the moment and then go back later to um, write everything down. Be enthusiastic and be yourself. Um, show the person that you're interviewing that you truly do care about what they have to say. And um, the last thing that I learned, which is really important, is to be quiet. So ask the question and then let them speak. Um, don't have them feeling like you're going to cut them off or um, they won't be able to finish what they have to say. So just be quiet. Sub-essential question five, how are women treated in third world countries and in first world countries? So through my research, I found that Afghanistan, also Haiti, among others, are the worst places in the world for women to live, and this is due to violence. Um, in Haiti, one in 11 women do from, die from childbirth. 87% um, of women never get an education. And there's also a lot of sex trafficking, both in these third world countries, but also here in the US. Um, I also wanted to take a look at Haitian mothers compared to US <coughs> mothers. Haitian mothers have six kids minimum, which is a lot of children, um, and often they come from a background of poverty, so when they have their children, they're also raising them through this poverty, which is just a tough circumstance. Um, US mothers are also in charge of many kids, but um, raising children here is a lot more expensive, um, and also there can be wage gap in jobs, sometimes an unsafe workspace for women to work in. Um, and my sub-essential question number six is how can photojournalism be a celebration of one's life? So the inspiration behind this were these three books over here. Humans of New York was gifted to me a couple Christmases ago and I fell in love with photojournalism. <coughs> the next is Annie Leibovitz and then the next is Dying in Vain which is my outside experts book. Um, <clears throat> so the photojournalism is basically it's storytelling so it gives so much life and purpose to someone who is being interviewed. Um, it gives somebody a voice. It's vulnerable and it's personal, but in extremely good ways. And also, it's about answering questions that you most likely would not be asked otherwise. Um, <clears throat> I will get into this more when I talk about my applied piece. So for my outside, outside expert, it is Kathy McKay, who's sitting right here. Thank you for coming. Um, she's a former teacher here at Sauhegan. She's also a photojournalist and, like I said, the author of the book. Um, so her um, advice that she sent me was some of my favorite is a lot more personal than I was able to find on Google or anything like that. Um, this is a few of the things that she told me. So begin with conversation, get to know your subject to build trust before starting. Share a part of yourself, whether that be vulnerabilities or experiences. Ask open-ended questions, not, ans or not questions that can be answered with a yes or no. Um, ask follow-up questions. And then after you get an answer, if it's not clear, reiterate it back so that you're definitely getting the right facts for your story. Um, offbeat questions often lighten the mood. Um, find a comfortable and quiet location. Be open-minded. The answers are most likely not what you're, you are expecting. Um, and then also when taking photos, figure out what you want to say about her ahead of time, whether that be strength, resilience, suffering. And then once you get there, you will have a plan of how you want to capture her. 
So for my applied piece, this is a very shortened list of what it took to finish this project. Um, so first I want to talk about Haiti. Um, I have taken four trips there total. Um, this la the last trip I went on was an extended time. It was five weeks this past July. Um, and the other trips that I had been on were week-long trips. And the schedules were definitely like running, 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 running until the end of the day when we would debrief and then go to bed. And it was kind of like we had so much that we wanted to fit into that single week that um, it kind of didn't feel like you were really getting a feel for the culture or anything. So what was really cool about being there for five weeks over the summer is we lived a day-to-day -day life and we were able to observe people who and how their normal day would um, be going. And so our mission there was to pour into the women and give them a purpose. Um, through this, we taught them the art of embroidery, which you see the embroidery hoops over here. Um, the idea behind that was to teach them this art so that they can <coughs> embroider clothing, um, bags, and then we also taught them how to sew. So the hope was we could leave enough products there um, that we could uh, leave for them and so that they could use them and maybe sell the products either in the market or we can bring back to the United States to sell here um, as support for them financially. Uh, what was really cool about our trip was the senior project, that's not why I went down, but it fit in so well with our mission. And so um, that was just really awesome that it was complementing what we were already doing while we were there. So why I picked who I picked. Um, the women in Haiti I had either known for years, they were a part of who I chose for embroidery, um, they did my laundry, um, I met them in the market, and then there was even one woman, her name is Berlene, and she would stand at the top of the hill where her house was, and for every single year that I went there, whenever she saw us coming, she would stand and just wave at me. And I had actually never really met her other than just like a bonjour in the market, um, until I finally walked up to her one day and asked if I could interview her to be a part of my project. Um, and so it's just these women that left an impact on me. And when I knew that I wanted to start my project in Haiti, I had already had a list of people that I knew I wanted to be involved. Um, so the tough thing about this project in Haiti was obviously they speak a different language than me. Um, it's Creole. And so what kind of was a downside to interviewing was I needed a translator. And um, it wasn't really a first-hand interview from me to the woman. So I would ask the question to the translator for her to then ask it to the lady for it then to be translated back to me to write down. And so I lost that sense of connection that I got with all of the women in New Hampshire, um, which was definitely a downside, but I, I think that I still got to know them um, just as much which was really cool. Um, another thing about interviewing them is they definitely have an in-the-box mentality and lifestyle. So they don't really um, dream, and they don't really think beyond survival mode. And so basically they have to work enough to get money to then um, make food for their children and just keep living on a day-to-day. And so that was a huge contrast between the interviews that I had in Haiti and the ones that I had here in New Hampshire. Um, and there was like a general consensus of the women and they all mostly felt that they were either discriminated against um, or they didn't really have too much purpose in their life and especially as they grew up, that wasn't really drilled into them. And so um, just seeing their jobs and everything, it was really interesting to see how they were getting by, if that's how you work with it. Um, so to talk about a few of the women, you can go and read all of their articles if you would like to know more. Um, but the woman over here with her arm on the door, this is Isna, and um, she did my laundry. She made fun of me when I tried to do it, it's really hard. Um, but she also ran a dance club across the street and with her husband. And she wanted to pose in the doorway of it. I don't know if it was free advertising. <laughs> if you're ever in Haiti, check it out. Um, on market day, she would have music booming until late into the night when I was trying to sleep. And um, But she's just really cool. And what I noticed about her is that her features are so much more striking than a bunch of the other women that I noticed. And so she just really stood out to me. Um, the one in the middle is Shuka. She is 18. Um, she lives at the house that I lived at, and um, 
with the missionaries who are full-time in Haiti. Um, she is an amazing cook, and the reason I positioned her where she is is she's right in front of a blue door, and inside of that door is the kitchen. And so when I thought of Shuka, I thought of amazing meals, and so I placed her there because that's how she was represented in my mind. Um, over here, this is Tifi. She also did my laundry. Um, she is a powerhouse of a woman who does not take no for an answer. Um, so while I was trying to track her down to take her portrait, she was actually kind of running away from me for a week or so. Um, the reason being, she had gotten in a fight with her husband, and he had beat her to the point where he left this mark on her cheek, as you can see in the photo. Um, I didn't want to push it, I didn't want to make her take her photo if she didn't want to, but um, the translator that I was working with, the missionary there, she had gone to her and she said, this is a part of your story, and um, it says a lot about you, and so we were like, we're going to let you be, and if you feel like it, you can come to me. And she came to me and she said, I want to be posed in front of the laundry lines because um, that just reminds me of her. So, New Hampshire. So I picked New Hampshire in contrast to Haiti, obviously because I live here and so many of the people here have shaped me. Um, and there, I so I texted each person that I had um, to be a part of my project, and I set up 11 different interviews, so 11 in Haiti and 11 here, um, and I planned these interviews over the span of a month, um, scheduling-wise, um, whether that be through their working schedule, their home life schedule, it was a little bit difficult, um, but I definitely was able to plan it all, and it worked very well in the end. Um, obviously, what's cool about New Hampshire interviews was we do speak the same language, so I didn't need a translator. It definitely had um, such a personal connection, which was awesome. So why I picked who I picked, um, the people here have obviously grown and shaped me. Um, they're people who have left a lasting impact on me. Um, they're just people with amazing stories that I was extremely curious about, so I wanted to know more about them. Um, the first one I'm going to be talking about is my mom. Uh, her name is Holly, and um, she is extremely determined and hardworking. And growing up with that figure in my life definitely shaped me into who I am, whether that be school or anything that I put my mind to. Um, what was really special about interviewing my mom was I had heard all the stories, or most of them before, but I had such a greater appreciation for them um, this time around. So. She was my last interview, and it just felt like the whole project came and tied right at the end, because not only were all of the stories just incredible, but these were ones that I could relate to, and ones that included me, and um, it was just cool to see so much of who I am today in her. Um, the one in the middle, this is Katie Kunis. Um, she was my old babysitter. Bless her, I don't know how she was my own face. <laughs> um, but what's so cool about her is that she definitely chases her dreams. She is such a hard worker. She's in law school right now to become a lawyer. Um, and she's just so inspiring. And just talking with, to her, she's like, yeah, I have eight finals next week, but I'm really glad you could come. And it just felt like she didn't have a lot of time. But she definitely fit me in, and her story was so cool. Um, this one on the right. This is Jessica. Um, I've known her for a little over a year, and the thing that stands out most about her is that she pushes me in uncomfortable ways, but in very good ways. Um, she definitely loves me a lot, and she's such a strong woman who has come from such a tough background growing up in New York, um, but getting to interview her, I saw why she is who she is today, and um, that was also really awesome. So the process. Um, my senior project had two parts. It had a lot of parts to it, but basically I would break it down into the interviews and the photographs, and then my gallery wall, which you can see out there. Um, it was hours on hours on hours of work um, for the interviews and the photographs. Um, but I really enjoyed so much about the process. Um, so some of the interview questions, I would have the women from New Hampshire pick about five so that they were prepared to answer um, when I got there. Some of them being, what was the relationship like with your mother? Was there a point in your life that changed the direction of your future? What did you want to be when you grew up? Did you achieve your initial goal? What motivates you? What is one defining moment in your life? What is a struggle you've had to live through? 
what is it like to be a mother and what's the most important thing? So they're also just extremely deep questions and um, what was cool about it was some of them lasted 35 minutes, some lasted an hour and 35 minutes. And so I would sit in this coffee shop, A&E, and I would um, listen back to each recording and like retake my notes and then I would begin, I would begin to write. And so each um, write up amounted to about a page. Um, and then I edited my photos in Lightroom and I printed them through Snapfish. Um, I mounted them on foam core and, um, and then I measured and hung the wall and um, I hung my wall up. So this was such a huge project but it really meant so much to me. Um, so making connections. Um, what was so cool about the process was I wanted to connect the people that lived in Haiti and the people that lived here. And um, the first connection I want to make is between Johan and Ashima. Um, the reason they're connected is they both have started their own business, very different businesses. Um, but Johan is the cold drink lady in the market. And you can walk up to her and she'll have a cooler full of whatever you would like. Um, and so I positioned her in front of the cooler and the umbrella because that's just what represents her to me. Um, Ashima is a event decorator and her business is called True Elegance and so she basically sets up and um, takes a vision for an event and then um, makes it come to life. I've actually had the opportunity to work alongside her which is really cool um, and especially because she started the business herself. Um, the second um, connection I'd like to make is between Berlin and Julianne. So um, Julianne obviously works here and she's amazing. So both of these women, their kids definitely have a center. The kids are at the center of their life and they are such great mothers. But what definitely sticks out the most to me is how much life they have to them. And they're so happy and bubbly and um, when I was actually interviewing Berlin, I had never told Julianne this, but I was talking with her, and when she said her, she wanted her kids to be a part of it, I said, wow, I want Julianne to be a part of this project. Like, she just reminded me so much of you, and so um, that was really cool to be able to make that connection once I got back. Um, so the point of my project was to give women a voice. I wanted to honor them through my work and bring light to third world and first world countries and their issues. Um, I wanted to connect these women, and although the struggles are extremely different, um, they're still struggles and they're just as valid. And um, I wanted to show that the major thing separating us is space. But once you start to read a few of them on the wall, you can see that you probably connect to them in some kind of way. Um, I wanted to portray that our stories, our successes, our failures are what make us resilient, powerful, and they are what make us human. Leah Sutherland, my mentor. Um, thank you for letting me cry in your office all year long. <laughs> um, thank you to my panel for passing my checkpoints, but also for giving me so much feedback throughout this whole process. Thank you to Kathy McKay. I know we never got to meet in person, but I really appreciated um, how you got back to my emails with just um, so much enthusiasm. Um, thank you to all of the women and for all of you being able to make it today. It really means a lot to me. Um, my family, my mom and dad, thank you for just inspiring my idea and telling me that it was going to be okay and that it was worth it when I didn't always see it. <laughs> had mentioned that her um, so her mom and dad were divorced but she had met her dad pretty recently to when I had interviewed her and she said that her dad is the father to 22 children 
which I thought was absolutely ridiculous. I didn't even know that was a thing. Um, <laughs> but um, that was just that was just really crazy. But um, other than that, I just the stories were so striking, and um, it's just amazing when you're able to ask someone something about their life and just find out so much more than um, what you knew before. And that was really cool. Did you end up picking up any Haitian Creole slash French since they also speak both languages there? Yes. Um, my two years of French, that's all I lasted through in high school. Uh, that helped me a little bit, but also going for four trips, I would know some um, uh, phrases. And we also had a dictionary that we were able to use also, which helped us out. Um, there, but it's tough to form sentences. And there was a Haitian student here, actually, who moved in Carlos. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Did you find the people in, the, in Haiti to be emotional about their situations, or was it just, this is life? Not at all, actually. Not they, emotional? Yeah, they weren't they were very emotional. Um, I mean, other than just like happiness, but they didn't ever, like they were never like, yeah, I wish things were better. Yeah. Um, because, you know, they have obviously lived there their entire life, so it's just how it's always been. I don't really think they know different. Yeah. And so, um, yeah. I mean, the stories are really sad, some of them, but they didn't really seem too, too affected. Also, they, Haitians, they always have kind of like this composure that's like mean and like closed off and um, kind of breaking down that barrier was definitely really cool when I was able to get some emotion out of them. Um, everyone has commented on how gorgeous the swall is. People are talking about all the time around school. Um, but because a lot of your influence came from books, I was wondering if it ever crossed your mind, or I don't know if you want to think about this right now, but the possibility of it becoming a book. Yeah, so I had actually talked to my mom about this. Um, the only thing is, <coughs> I don't know how I would go about that. Um, <laughs> I don't, <laughs> that, that's a this is true. <laughs> um, I I would honestly want to add more to it. Um, I was thinking like maybe just like a craft project type book. I don't know if it would ever be published um, like this, but I definitely want to let this live on because it was a lot of work and also um, there's just a bunch of stories. It's tough to go and stand at the wall and read through a whole one, so I wanted to give people the opportunity to do, opportunity to do that if they wanted to. Yes. I have an idea. I think if you get farther in photojournalism, you should go to a whole different bunch of countries, including Christian, Muslim, Jewish, and just have a giant lookbook of different people from the different countries. That's a great idea. Thank you. <laughs> How did you balance the respect for protection of people's privacy? with telling their stories. Did you ever feel tension between that or certain um, places you could go? Yeah, there are a few times where um, they would pause and say, how much of this are you including? And I would just, once someone said that, I would say this obviously is not a part of what wants to be you know, on a wall. And so um, I would definitely respect their privacy in that aspect. Um, something that I didn't mention also was <coughs> how much pressure this was. Um, and because, you know, these are like real people and they're in our community also extremely far away, but um, it's still their stories and their lives and you could go as much into depth or not um, as you wanted to, but I definitely tried to respect the privacy of um, everyone involved and maybe not include as many details or if there was that tension in the moment, I would just say, okay, this is when I'm gonna like stop the recording and then continue when um, everything felt better again, so. I was just gonna ask, um, I'm assuming, I don't know if I'm assuming it correctly, but probably a lot of the women in Haiti do not see a lot of pictures of them, 